Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is John DeBella, and on behalf of Simulations Plus, I welcome you to today's webinar, where we will describe and demonstrate the new features in DDD Plus version 6, which have been implemented in ways to really help you reimagine both your in vitro dissolution and now precipitation studies. Jim Mullen, team leader of simulation technologies and the DDD Plus product manager, will be speaking today. An opportunity to ask questions will take place at the end of Jim's presentation. You may either type your question using the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel, or you may ask your question directly using the hand raising icon. This webinar is being recorded for playback at the online resource center on our website www.simulations-plus.com. Also, upon request, the presentation slides can be made available and shared with colleagues. It is now my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Jim. Take it away, Jim. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's uh, get right into it. Um, so, First, we'll talk about a little bit about an. We'll have a little bit of an intro about DDD Plus. If you haven't used the software before, um, what it's used for, um, and what you know, basic features are in the program. Um, so, how can uh, DDD Plus be used to uh, model um, dissolution? Um, well, a couple different ways. Um, dissolution method development. Um, how can I design my in vitro experiment to correlate with in vivo release? Of course, this has helped out if you. Um, use the Gastro Plus platform and the IVIVC module to be able to deconvolute the in vivo dissolution profile for your formulations. Then you can bring that data into DDD Plus and use it to try to tune your in vitro experiment to get um, a similar release rate as your in vivo release. Um, formulation design, how, how you might modify formulation ingredients to produce uh, the desired in vitro dissolution rate that meets a target um, profile. So these are two key usages of the software. Another another usage case is um, establishing dissolution specifications. So you know, many times there's variability in in the processing of uh, formulations, um, and so um, there can be variability in your dissolution experiment. Um, either caused by the content uniformity uh, or the uh, production, as I said. Um, you may want to see whether or not that um, those those that variability in dissolution um, translates to any in vivo um, bio inequivalence in a, in a sense. So you could use the population simulator within GastroPlus to test the upper and lower ranges of the dissolution specifications that you um, are likely to see um, and see if those are bioequivalent. So um, a way to use the software together, both DDD Plus and GastroPlus to to really um, check and make sure that those uh, that variability is not going to be key in vivo. What is DDD Plus? It's a software program that allows you to simulate uh, dissolution. So you can simulate the dissolution rate for active pharmaceutical uh, ingredients and excipients both and as such you can specify the particle size distribution for both the API and excipients. You can set certain excipients to be solubilizers or disintegrants, that kind of thing. Um, we have a variety of dosage form models, so IR models for powder, solution, uh, tablet, capsule, um, CR models for swellable matrices, um, and then also we have some new formulation models which we're going to talk about here today. Uh, we do a full dynamic microclimate pH calculation at the surface of the API crystals and uh, the excipients, um, and also a full pH calculation of uh, the bulk phase pH based on the equilibrium pH calculations in the system. Um, and we also do that for our, our uh, uh, new um, formulation models, which I'll, I'll show a little bit later. So uh, based on this for this pH calculation, we have to take into account the composition of all acids, bases, and salt equivalents. So, you know, we're tracking through the simulations, you know, sort of what the concentrations are um, of the buffers and calculating the pH. We have various different apparatuses that you can choose from, uh, USP 1, 2, 4, an open or closed loop configuration, and then um, 
uh, microdisc profiler um, from Pion. Uh, we have a multi-stage or uh, what we call phase dissolution experiment um, option where you can set, you know, like a gastric to intestinal buffer transit uh, experiment up. So if you have, you know, drug dissolving at pH 1.2, then you can have it translate transfer to a, a you know an intestinal buffer at pH 6.5. Um, we also have updated our myself uh, facilitated uh, dissolution. So you know we you can model biorelevant surfactants. You can model um, QC dissolution surfactants like SLS or um, tween. Um, but we also in this version have allowed you to uh, model more than two surfactants. Um, and also um, in the dissolution phase experiments, you can specify buffers with uh, different surfactants, and that will automatically be tracked and, and utilized for the calculations of solubility. Uh, formulation models, this was, these were the formulation models available in uh, version 5 of the software. I'll show you the new ones in, for, ver for version 6 um, here in a minute, but um, you know, uh, in version 5 at least we had powder, tab tablet, capsule, be uh, IR bead coating, a delayed release coated tablet, and CR um, controlled release matrix tablets, and a bilayer tablet. Again, the experimental apparatuses are sort of shown here. Uh, the USP1, USP2, USP4 flow through an open or closed loop in the uh, PION microdisc profiler um, are, are available. We have some new, um, we have a new uh, uh, ASD uh, model, artificial stomach duodenum uh, apparatus model that we've added here um, to, to a TDD plus six, and we'll show that here in a minute. Um, of course, once you've run a simulation and set set that all up, you can you know output the results in several ways um, and or analyze the uh, formulation in several several ways. You can simply plot the uh, percent release versus time for the different excipients and the active ingredient up here on the upper left hand um, corner of the screen. You can look at the pH changes in the micro in the microclimate and in the bulk fluid. You can do virtual trials to look at your dissolution variability based on process or um, content uniformity. You can do PSA analysis to look at you know what would happen if I changed um, the particle size a certain amount or you know um, pH of the media a certain amount. Uh, and then F1 and F2 calculations can be done as well. Um, so that gets us to that's you know the introduction of the software, um, getting you refamiliar familiarized with what it is, um, and now I'm going to go into the new features of uh, in version six. So the main new features here are going to be we're going to talk about three new apparatuses. We have the artificial stomach duodenum, membrane dissolution, and the biphasic dissolution. Um, a few new tools. So we have batch processing F1 and F2 tool. Um, so you can read in a bunch of different in vitro profiles and calculate F1, F2, um, and then improved multi-stage dissolution experiments. Also new models, so new models for long-acting injectable PLGA microspheres, um, IR solution uh, model for precipitation, and then uh, CR coded bead model. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the artificial stomach duodenum model. So um, on the drop-down for apparatus type, you can now select artificial stomach duodenum model. It allows you to model three compartment um, ASD uh, model, which is similar to like the um, literature um, experiments you find that have been published by Pfizer, Lilly, um, University of Michigan, that kind of thing, where you have an initial um, drug dose to the stomach. Um, it uh, The drug gets emptied via a, at, at some rate the gastric emptying time here, um, and then it gets pumped into the duodenum volume, um, which is held constant at a, at a given volume, um, and then uh, the pump uh, that uh, pumps the, the fluid out of the duodenum into the jejunum is, you know, 
automatically adjusted such that the duodenum stays at that constant volume. And then the waste compartment just collects all the um, buffer flows from the upper compartments um, into this waste or jugenum compartment. Um, in the model, you have the ability to select the initial buffer for every single compartment. So initial buffer would be just the initial concentration of all the buffers in the stomach, duodenum, and waste compartment. And then you also have replenishment buffers or reservoir buffers is what we call them, where you can pump in fresh buffer into the stomach, the duodenum, um, or the waste compartment. Um, typically, you would be pumping in two or four times concentrated facif in the duodenal um, compartment to counteract the acid um, changes that are, uh, that are occurring based on the gastric emptying. And then again, you have the, the choice to um, you know, set your initial volumes of the system. Uh, if you, you can use constant pH mode, so you could set the pHs of each compartment, or the software will automatically dynamically calculate the concentration of all the buffers, salts in, in each compartment and calculate the pH um, uh, you know, using the equilibrium um, equations. You can set the buffer flows, uh, transit time for a solid dosage form. So this would be for like an IR tablet. You can set um, if, if it's manually uh, moved from compartment to compartment. Otherwise, the um, solids that are dissolved, uh, well, not, let, not necessarily dissolved, we'll call them released into the fluid, will transit based on the transit times of the system, based on the gastric emptying and the flow rates of the buffers. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is, is really, um, you know, one of our flagship new models that allows you to, um, you know, really look at the transit between compartments and the precipitation that happens in going from the stomach to the duodenum compartment for like a basic drug, let's, let's say, for instance. And we have one example, one quick example of how, how this is done um, for pioglitazone. Um, where we have, uh, where we're able to pull out, pull out literature for the, um, uh, to build a uh, gastro plus model. So we have the volume of distribution, the clearance, the permeability of this compound, um, and we have um, information regarding the PKA and log P from ADMET predictor. We're able to um, find uh, solubility data and literature for pioglitazone across the pH ranges. So we were able to build a nice um, dissolution model for for uh, and and gastro plus model for this compound. Um, so um, we took some literature data for the ASD where they looked at the um, a tablet of pioglitazone at 30 megs, um, dosing that into the stomach and then watching it um, dissolve uh, fully into the stomach, then trans transfer to the duodenum and then be collected in the jujet compartment and we looked at that and tried to calculate the particle size uh, of the API and the precipitation rate um, which were unknown values in the system so um, we used the five mil a minute initial gastric emptying rate as the training set to calculate the particle size and the precipitation rate and then we applied that same values to the 7.5 mil a minute and 10 mil a minute initial gastric emptying rate um, uh, so um, with that, uh, the default parameters on the left are just 25 microns particle size. The default, um, since we didn't know the particle size, we optimized it and, um, and then uh, calculated the precipitation time in, uh, of pioglitazone as it goes from high solubility environment in the gastric, uh, the red, uh, to the uh, du uh, ju sorry, duodenum compartment, the yellow, and then the collection into the jugenum compartment. So we found that a precipitation time of about 2,000 seconds, 2,200 seconds was uh, uh, what was needed to fit that data set. Um, we also, it's not shown here, but we also found simple precipitation assays where they just dose solution into a vessel and watched it precipitate. And those precipitation times ranged from 100 seconds to 1,000 seconds. So in this case, the ASD model did seem to provide um, maybe a little bit more realistic precipitation times um, than a more simple experiment. Uh, we then applied those parameters to uh, the faster gastric emptying times and uh, 
and you know we got fairly decent results with the same parameters so we then tried to use those within a gastro plus model to to simulate the uh, precipitation of pioglitazone in vivo to see if it matched the co uh, concentration time profile in the plasma so we got data from i think this is philip philipos and amatava's paper um, in 2015 where um, they modeled pioglitazone um, and uh, so we got the pl plasma concentration data. Um, they found that you know a model that maybe had um, close to no precipitation in this case seemed to fit the data. Um, and so we wanted to see if our settings uh, from the ASD um, also um, may may work in this case. So we built the model. And of course, we use the ASD precipitation time on the right-hand side. You can see the plot with the 200, or sorry, 2,246 second precipitation time, and we overpredict precipitation in this kind, in this case uh, versus the uh, 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 precipitation time of a thousand seconds, which is necessary to match the um, in vivo data. Um, the rationale here being is that again at least in this case, the ASD was precipitation time was not predictive of in vivo precipitation. Um, and the rationale for this is potentially that's because the buffer wasn't fully biorelevant. Um, in this case, uh, they didn't use any surfactants because pioglitazone really doesn't have, even though it's low solubility, doesn't have a, a large impact of bile salt solubilization. So they, they figured that they could do the experiment without that. Um, however, that might inhibit precipitation. So um, this may not be exactly a, a good um, example in this case, but at least shows you how the model can be used to extract precipitation times. Um, we've also developed a membrane dissolution test. So um, membrane dissolution is where you have a donor phase, which is the aqueous phase of the dissolution vessel. Um, so you'll have dissolution occurring from your API particles. Um, then once it's in solution, there's a uh, the drug is going to diffuse through the unstirred water layer up to the membrane surface, where there's a partition coefficient, uh, and the drug can then enter the um, sort of phospholipid phase of the membrane. Then it can diffuse across the membrane to the receiver side. There's another partition coefficient that defines the difference between the concentration in the membrane and the receiver phase, and then diffusion through the unstirred water layer of the receiver phase. Um, this model is, is typically good for evaluating formulations in terms of determining what the um, solubility of the formulation is. So if you have different amorphous forms or, or you know, co-crystal form, the flux will change or increase based on the concentration. And this, this model is good for, you know, looking at um, enhancements in flux due to, to the uh, actual solubility of the formulation. So this model allows you to look at those types of cases. Um, to see what your formulation solubility is. And then, you know, um, all the inputs are available for you to enter the receiver volume, the viscosity of the receiver fluid, the diffusion layer thicknesses, the membrane thickness, the membrane area, the membrane porosity. We're assuming that it's filled with a phospholipid type um, uh, material, so we have a um, correlation that relates the log p in octanol um, versus, um, you know, water to the membrane partition coefficient, and that can be used to estimate the membrane solubility in this uh, experiment based on the log p. And then the receiver solubility is something that you can enter in manually. Um, you know, different companies may use different proprietary fluids, so we don't necessarily know the solubility in the receiver compartment, so you might need to enter that in as an input. And you can set the diffusion coefficients as well. For the biphasic dissolution experiment, again, it's a similar experiment to the membrane dissolution, except for there's no membrane in this case. Um, and we're going to go through an example with itraconazole, um, another class two low solubility compound um, where, you know, at physiologic pH, it's extremely low solubility. I think based on the general solubility equation, it's about 100 nanograms per mil predicted solubility, but um, it could be even lower than that. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen a good measurement out there in the in the literature. Um, it's got a log p of you know extremely high log p of up towards close to six, uh, 
and uh, it's got several PKs, so it's soluble in gastric, and and then obviously will precipitate in in, uh, in um, the intestinal uh, pH of you know near six six and a half. Um, so our biphasic dissolution model again similarly allows drug to be uh, dissolving based on our normal um, uh, mass transfer model or or uh, Johnson model in the aqueous phase, and then once it's in solution, it can diffuse through the aqueous boundary layer um, to the organic interface where it can partition into the organic phase, and then uh, it'll diffuse through the unstirred water layer of the organic. Um, we're assuming that a cylindrical slice of the vessel is the surface area for this um, transport to be occurring. Um, if you have any vortexing in your vessel or any and uh, increase in area, you're going to have to manually enter that information in. Um, uh, right now, we're assuming that the organic to water partition coefficient is going to be the same as the lo uh, log P. If you use other solvents, you'll have to go in and manually enter the, the solubility in the organic. Um, but you can estimate it just based on the log P for, for most compounds, if it's decanol or octanol, you know, obviously. And then again, you have the opportunity to uh, select what the volume of that phase is, the viscosity, density, uh, diffusion layer thicknesses, and then interfacial area. So in our example, we looked at data from um, Carl Box from uh, <coughs> Sirius Analytical, where they use the Sirius Inform instrument to look at the um, uptake of drug into the organic phase. Um, they dosed uh, the drug as a as a solution into 40 mLs of phosphate buffer at pH 6.5 and then allowed the drug to um, both partition into the organic phase and precipitate if if uh, the drug had, you know, let's say a basic pK, um, it's going to start uh, pre precipitating at pH 6.5 at the same time as it's transferring into the organic phase. Um, in this case, again, we're looking at itraconazole because we already had a uh, gastro plus model built for itraconazole but you can see and we we did model all these compounds here um, that you see in in the plot but we're just going to be focusing on itraconazole in this example so we we built the model using our new biphasic test for itraconazole precipitation um, so as the drug is dosed to the uh, pH 6.5 solution phosphate buffer, it uh, starts absorbing into the organic phase. So at the initial time points, you see a rapid decrease in the aqueous phase and then a rapid increase in the organic phase. But then you see it roll off rather quickly as the precipitation occurs. So um, you can use that um, to... Uh, that fact to actually fit the precipitation time and the size of the precipitate. One thing that's hard to see here is that if you look at, um, uh, at after the drug precipitates, you'll see a steady increase in the organic, and that's determined by the sort of particle size and the redissolution of the uh, uh, the precipitate as it um, uh, you know is, is sitting in the aqueous phase, and it can be it still is going to translate transfer into the organic phase over time. Um, based on that redissolution um, and the particle size of, of, of the API. Um, so we fit two different models, a first order model and the mechanistic nucleation model, which is also new to DDD plus version um, six. So we uh, uh, implemented the same mechanistic uh, uh, precipitation model as is in gastro plus, which is the Linfors model. Um, and we've also added a new version as well. Um, so, so you'll have those uh, versions to, to use. Um, here we fit the exponential correction and Linfors parameter of the mechanistic nucleation and growth. Um, so we could compare it to the values that we found for, um, that were fit to the in vivo data for itraconazole across uh, all our data sets for um, all our in vivo data sets, I should say. Um, we had a model built for itraconazole. Uh, K. Jetto um, from Simulations Plus. Uh, I think this is 2015 or 2014 at AAPS presented um, on the drug-drug interaction uh, between midazolam and, and itraconazole. Um, she looked at uh, formula, I think nine different DDI formulations and a bunch of different single dose studies and built a model holistically across all the data sets. So when we look at each data set, it's not 
perfectly going to fit every data set because keep in mind it was built against a ton of different clinical data sets from different labs, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're going to do is compare our in vitro model parameters to what she had found in a global fit to all the, all the data. We're only going to be looking at the single dose data for itraconazole um, rather than the DDI studies. Um, so we don't, it makes the, it makes looking at the uh, precipitation a little bit easier. Um, so um, on the on these next four slides or so, um, the in vitro uh, di uh, precipitation parameters that were extracted from the biphasic dissolution experiment and DDD plus are on the left. So in vivo simulations using those in vitro parameters are on the left hand side. The in vivo fitted parameters based on uh, K's work um, for the uh, itraconazole model from her poster are on the right hand side. And so we're going to compare the IVIBE precipitation kinetics with the global fit to all the DDI data sets, basically. And then the and then the table we show the difference in the parameters that were fit between the in vivo data and the in vitro. So we got pretty similar parameters with the uh, biphasic uh, dissolution precipitation test here, and we're going to test those. And for the fed capsule at 200 megs, you really don't see any precipitation. If you look at the red curve, which is the amount dissolved versus time, here you can see that there's really no precipitation occurring. Um, so um, that's predicted well by each set of parameters in this case. For the IR capsule formulation, you start to see some amount of precipitation, although um, not not too much. And both um, sets of parameters predict about the same amount of precipitation for the 200 meg fasted uh, capsule. When we get to the solution dosage forms, that then it, then we're going to start to see major amounts of precipitation occur. So if you look at the 200 meg um, PO solution of uh, itraconazole dosed in vivo you see a lot of precipitation as the drug is fully soluble and doesn't have to dissolve. Um, so um, as, it trans and as it transfers into the duodenum, you see a, uh, a large amount of uh, precipitation shown in the amount dissolved curve in red here. And each model predicts fairly similarly similar amounts of precipitation with the in vitro parameters, again, slightly predicting more precipitation than the in vivo parameters um, here in this case. Um, where we see a, a fairly uh, decent sized misfit to the data well with both parameters, to be honest, is the um, PO solution in 200 meg. Um, uh, we see uh, over prediction using the in vitro parameters here and an under prediction using the global fit to all the DDI data sets for this data set from Barone. And, uh, but we also had 100 mig solution PO, uh, PO sorry, 100 mig PO solution uh, in the fasted state. And um, in this case, it seems like the parameters from the in vitro experiment actually are a little bit better than the um, the ones that were fit to globally to the in vivo data. So, you know, it's hit or miss. Um, but in this case, at least the biphasic dissolution parameters seem to provide reasonable estimations or IVIVE of precipitation kinetics across all the data sets. Um, so it seemed like the organic phase was able to provide some level of capacity for the drug to reduce supersaturation and absorb some of the drugs so that it, you know, didn't precipitate and, um, you know, yield fairly reasonable uh, estimations of precipitation kinetics so that they could be transferred to the in vivo simulation and used in a GastroPlus model. Um, so some new tools that we've provided here in um, DDD Plus as far as, uh, uh, you know, doing some modeling and simulation of dissolution. Um, we have a new batch processing tool to compare in vitro profiles. So um, we, you know, there was some requests to be able to read in a large amount of, you know, in vitro data. Um, so if you've created a bunch of different DSD or in vitro dissolution files, you can load those in. And you can select a reference profile and a comparison profile, and then compare the F1 and F2 statistics for those two profiles. You can, you know, um, also 
compare against uh, all files. So if you read in, let's say, 50 files, you can select one as the reference profile, and it'll calculate the F1, F2 for uh, against all the different files that you've imported. So um, it allows you to do quick comparisons of a bunch of different in vitro experiments, basically, for F1 and F2. And then um, we've also improved the multi-stage dissolution experiments. I talked about this a little bit in the intro. Um, but uh, now what you'll see, and this, uh, you'll see a little bit of a change in the interface here where we've added the buffer media and this replacement uh, selection here to the uh, multi-stage dissolution experiments. And what that does is it allows you to specify the, the full, you know, uh, time course of the buffer um, changes during your multi-phase dissolution experiment. So basically you could have an, you know, acidic, let condition and then have that switch over to let's say a facif condition and it'll model the full you know buffer mixtures so let's say normally how this is done is you'll use 250 mils or 500 mils of um, acid buffer and then you'll add some quadruple strength facif buffer or double strength to um, to uh, come out to some sort of condition that's similar to facif in the in the second phase and now it'll completely calculate the mixture of all those buffer comp uh, components and um, automatically calculate the pH of all those components together. And also, you know, you can still, um, you can also select to replace buffer as well. So if you don't want to use the, well, if, if you completely replace the contents of your dissolution experiment um, and then put in fresh buffer, you can select replace buffer as well. So it so you can it's got a, a multiple different new functionalities that allow you to either have it mix the buffers together or replace them and then um, do the full microclimate uh, pH calculations now um, whereas that wasn't available before. It also will keep track of the different surfactants that are added so you could have different changes in surfactants if you wanted to in the buffer media files now. So we've added some decent new functionality to, to the uh, dissolution phase um, modeling. Uh, we've also added several new models to the software um, in DDD Plus. So um, the first one we'll talk about is long-acting injectables. Um, we entered in a three-year uh, collaborative uh, project with the FDA. Um, Office of Generic Drugs where we uh, they wanted us to develop some in vitro and in vivo tools to uh, analyze um, long-acting injectable formulations. Um, and this was not just focused on PLGA microspheres, but that was one main focus. And in this case, um, th this is the model we built for the in vitro. Um, but also, we recreated in vivo tools in Gastro Plus as well to do deconvolutions of um, long-acting injectables and and model the uh, dissolution or dissolution in the intramuscular and subcutaneous space of APIs um, th uh, diffusing through the um, injection capsule around um, uh, around the API. So um, under this work, we built an in vitro dissolution model for PLGA um, degradation and uh, dissolution. So it's a very sort of complicated situation. I think this uh, image that I took from the literature kind of explains how crazy it is at a lot of different arrows there, obviously, so uh, a lot of different processes going on. So Fredenberg um, published this in, in 2011, so I, I thought I'd steal it because I think it is a really good uh, graphic of what's going on. First of all, you have water permeating into the PLGA microsphere. Um, once the water is able to permeate into the uh, microsphere, it can hydrolyze the polymer. And um, once the polymer starts hydrolyzing, it's going to um, create free acid end groups on the large oligomers, and that's going to change the pH inside the microsphere and reduce it down to a value of around 4 to 5. Um, once that occurs, that's going to further drive degradation, and the acid end groups are going to start reacting with the polymer itself. We call that autocatalytic um, degradation, so where the actual acid end groups of the polymer itself um, catalyze the degradation further. Um, once the degradation occurs, uh, the oligomers can become soluble inside the matrix. So once the oligomers get to, I think it's around a size of nine uh, monomers in size, 
they can dissolve in water and form porosity. So you can get some formation of pores and cracks. Um, or you can just have diffusion through the polymer um, phase itself. So there's tons of different things going on here. Um, so we've created a, a, a reaction diffusion model um, to, to sort of explain all the physics going on here as best we can. It's very complicated, so it's a very complicated reaction diffusion partial differential equation model that we built to explain these different phenomena. Um, of course, you need some way of trying to predict um, what's going to happen when you change formulation. Um, so what happens when I go from a pure PLA uh, drug microsphere to a 50-50 uh, lactic to glycolic acid ratio in my polymer? Like what's going to happen? Uh, well, the degradation rate is going to increase, you know, as you go, f go from pure PLA to some sort of mixture of uh, lactic and glycolic acid. And so we tried to mine all the data from the literature and come up with some sort of um, scaling or, or functionality where we could pr try to predict what's going to happen versus lactic acid fraction in these microspheres. So based on all the data, we found the same functionality of how the degradation rate changes with lactic acid um, um, fraction in the, in the polymer. Um, of course, there's an offset here. And we believe that's because these none of these experiments reported what the particle size of the polymer was, what the manufact not all had the same manufacturers. There could be differences in capping of the polymer. Um, so you do see some offsets, but at least um, the trend over uh, lactic acid fraction of the degradation rate stays constant, the exponential um, degradation rate constant. So we applied that to scale our degradation equations in our uh, model such that you can try to predict differences in um, release versus lactic acid fraction. Um, and we did this in a couple different cases to see how that how well that predicted. Um, what we found is that uh, these these microspheres are very challenging in trying to predict um, what's happening or uh, the drug release from them. But in this case, uh, we fit uh, our partial differential equation reaction diffusion model to the PLGA, PLGA 8515, so 85% um, lactic acid versus 15% glycolic acid. We fit on that data set and then tried to predict using this, this uh, functionality of the weight change um, in the, uh, or, sorry, function of the lactic acid uh, change in degradation rate, um, tried to predict the other uh, pure PLA, 75% uh, PLGA, and then 50% PLGA. And we got, you know, mixed results, but it trends fairly well. We also did this for lanzapine LAIs. Um, in this case, there was also changes in molecular weight. So these are also changing in initial molecular weight, which, which is also going to affect the uh, rate of release as well. And we used one set of model parameters in our reaction diffusion um, partial differential equation model, and we are able to reproduce fairly decently the overall trends in molecular, both molecular weight and PLGA composition. So it's not perfect, but it is somewhat of a predictive tool to allow you to look at PLGA um, uh, polymer changes both in molecular weight and in the initial sort of lactic to glycolic acid ratio of the polymer. Of course, to select these models, you can just select them in the dosage form dropdown. Um, you can select either our simple model um, or the full partial differential equation, um, reaction diffusion equation model for uh, long-acting injectable microspheres. Um, you can select the microsphere parameters, and then you get a full um, inter interface as far as what the diffusion parameters are. So we have a diffusion model that's based on the current molecular weight of the polymer. So as the molecular weight decreases and the TG of the polymer becomes closer to water, the mobility of drug and and or oligomers, free acid, or water could change uh, drastically. So we allow you to specify an exponential or um, an inverse molecular weight functionality of the diffusion coefficient on the molecular weight of the polymer. You can also model pore diffusion. Um, so you can select whether or not you want to uh, include pore diffusion model in your um, 
in your reaction diffusion equations, you can set the initial pore radius and the bond lengths of lactic acid and glycolic acid, you'd leave constant. And um, as the as the polymer degrades, it'll calculate the change in the pore radius uh, versus that degradation amount. You can also set the uh, uh, polymer input parameters, the rate law for how it's going to degrade, the hydrolysis and autocatalysis degradation rates, the fraction of lactic acid in the polymer, um, the molecular weights of each of the um, monomers, uh, the pKa's of each monomer, uh, internal pH. So we have a constant pH model where you can just set the internal pH to, to that of um, you know, something that's reasonable. We, we pulled 4.9 out of literature from some measurements that were done, um, but uh, you could set that to, uh, you'd want to set it to somewhere around the pKa of, of, of the lactic and glycolic acid, obviously. Um, where you can do it, we have a pH variable rate law, um, which will try to calculate the pH based on the free acid that's in the system. You can also set the equilibrium water content in the microsphere, the soluble chain size of the oligomers that are being generated, and um, the particle properties. So this model is so complicated. There's like six, there's like six or so, um, five or six coupled partial differential equations all being solved simultaneously with reaction kinetics. So um, we had to limit it to one particle size um, currently. You know, maybe in the future we can open that up and you can model multiple particle sizes or a distribution of particle sizes. But for right now, um, it's limited to a single particle radius. Of course, um, based on the manufacturing process, and this is why it's so difficult to model these systems, is that how fast you solidify the particle uh, depends on what sort of drug distribution you get inside the particle. So this paper from Birkland is a good example where they were looking at um, PLGA microspheres um, for pyroxicam and uh, based on how rapid the particle solidifies, you get completely different drug distributions in the particle. So if you have a large particle and you um, solidify the particle slowly, uh, it gives the time the time for the drug to migrate maybe towards the surface of the particle and form some sort of um, concentrated surface where you then get burst release um, versus if a particle is smaller and can solidify very rapidly, you may get more of a uniform distribution. Um, and this could depend on the processing conditions as well, how fast you can get the solvent away from the polymer drug so it solidifies and, and, and hardens. Um, that's going to depend on what the the, the distribution is. So we've added that ability to change the inner particle drug distribution um, and we use the gamma distribution to allow you to do that. Um, so um, based on a shape parameter near the center and the surface of the um, particle, you can do either surface enrichment or surface depletion. Um, so it just kind of depends on what you want to model, but um, you can you can obviously account for these types of things. And then you have the same modeling options uh, as any other, you know, DDD plus model where you can do parameter sensitivity, virtual trials, or optimization of different parameters. This is a typical release profile for a PLGA microsphere. You have some amount of initials from the surface of the particle, and then you have to wait for several weeks for the to then or for the polymer to degrade, uh, and then the drug fully released, sort of at all at once when the polymer starts degrading. Okay, second model, we've added the IR solution model, and this was added so that you can model different precipitation assays. Um, so uh, I gotta move through this quickly. So um, we've added, we've synchronized the options from Gastro Plus so that you have all the same options now. Um, you can do first order multi, uh, mechanistic nucleation and growth. And we've added the options so that you can uh, form a new particle of a given radius that you're, you can define as the user or fit with the optimization module. And um, you can also grow the smallest bin in the particle size distribution now as well. Before, you could use for, uh, DDD plus version 5 and earlier would only grow precipita uh, precipitate of all particles in the distribution. 
Um, so quickly, um, I want to go through an example of how you would use this new IR solution precipitation model um, for this AstraZeneca compound, which is, again, another BCS class 2 base with pKa, low solubility of around, you know, close to 2 microgram per mil at um, close to physiologic pH. Um, and then fully soluble in gastric. So in this case, uh, this, this is Carlo's paper from 2010, where she um, uh, used a USP2 vessel and uh, started with 500 mils of concentrated FASF and pumped in 250 mils of acidified drug over 125 minutes, and then um, tried to model the precipitation uh, of the drug. Uh, here you can see a single exponential and a double exponential first order precipitation time uh, models try, uh, trying to fit this data. The single exponential doesn't work because there's a induction time for precipitation that takes oh, about 75 minutes or so in this case. Um, so for, for the first bit of time you have to use a really slow precipitation rate and then um, uh, for, for the second period of the experiment you have to use something like a thousand or 1,100 um, seconds for the precipitation time. So in DDD Plus, you can fit all these assays now. So you can just select the dosage form of uh, IR solution precipitation. You can set your flow rate of your donor phase into your acceptor phase and the time at which you know you pump that over. And then select select your precipitation option, and then you can model the these precipitation assays, transfer precipitation assays. You can also do multiple first order precipitation times now, so you can optimize the two different precipitation times and then the change time. So this is the change time, right? 75 minutes is when your precipitation rate will change. And you can then uh, model those and calculate the slow precipitation for the first period of the experiment and then the fast precipitation for the second um, stage of the experiment. You can also fit the mechanistic nucleation and growth parameters to the data using the optimization module. You can't do this in Gastro Plus because um, Gastro Plus uh, has so many other things going on that um, trying to optimize mechanistic nucleation with the PBPK modeling isn't really possible currently. So, but since the dissolution models are so much more simple, you can do this in, in DDD Plus. We allow you that opportunity. So you can optimize these parameters for doing IVIVE and taking those parameters and using them in Gastro Plus. Um, the final thing we'll talk about here is the new CR coded bead model. Um, we've uh, created a model where you can coat drug um, binder and API on a core material. Um, and then there's a, you can have an inner enteric coating um, a CR membrane with pore former, and then an outer enteric coating. And then you can have um, active or binder, you know, sort of uh, diffusing through those membranes based on their diffusion coefficients uh, and thickness of each layer. The thicknesses of each layer is determined by the amount of each uh, excipient that you uh, define in the formulation. Um, so it does a series uh, parallel, you know, sort of calculation of permeability through all those different layers. As these layers dissolve, the thickness will decrease and uh, go away. So, um, you know, uh, as, as, as time evolves, the, the amount of pore former dissolves, it will, you know, sort of increase the porosity. And as the enteric coatings dissolve away, it'll increase uh, the permeability of the binder and drug through that layer um, until once all the all the enteric coatings are dissolved, it, uh, the per it'll be free freely permeable through those layers. Of course, the enteric coatings are optional. You don't have to have the enteric coatings, so these are optional parameters, so you don't have to specify those, but you do have to specify at least a CR membrane and a pore former for this formulation. And you can set the different permeabilities for each layer in the interface, and, and all the inputs are available. So that's the summary of what we've provided in the new DDD plus six. Um, so we've uh, provided several new formulations, new apparatus um, for uh, IR solution, the LAI microsphere, the CR bead formulation, and then the ASD, the biphasic and membrane dissolution apparatus. Um, we've also synchronized the precipitation settings between Gastro Plus and DDD plus so that precipitation kinetics are the same between all models. Um, both Gastro Plus and DDD Plus. Um, so that's all I had to go through today. Uh, we'll have a here quick 10-minute or so 
question and answer period. I thank you for coming, um, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Um, but uh, first, let's let's go through those questions. Okay, great job, Jim. Uh, thank you very much. As Jim said, we'll now enter into the question and answer portion of today's webinar. And as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question using your telephone, uh, please be sure to use the hand raising icon on your control panel and enter in your unique audio pin. Uh, there are a number of questions that have come in written, so let's go through those first. Um, with regards to the precipitation models uh, in vitro, uh, some of the inaccuracy in using some of those estimates from the in vitro experiments for uh, in vivo predictions may be due to the simultaneous absorption that is taking place. So can you just briefly uh, summarize, Jim, uh, the models that have been added, the apparatus models to version 6? Uh, they have the potential to incorporate simultaneously the precipitation, redissolution, and absorption processes? Yeah, the, uh, in particular, the biphasic model. Um, th so the issue, you might think the membrane dissolution would be able to let you do this as well, but the, the membrane dissolution really doesn't um, generally provide enough surface area and capacity to absorb enough of the drug to to really limit the super saturation as, as you would see in vivo. So um, I think the better option is to try to use the biphasic model in that case. But um, we've added all these models for, for that purpose, right, to, to allow you to have an absorptive phase to try to um, improve your precipitation uh, uh, IV, IVE. So having an absorptive phase that might somehow mimic the reduction in the supersaturation. So, so the biphasic model is definitely there. We also added the ASD model because that model, it, it may not have absorption, but um, it, it definitely, you have the dilution that happens um, as you go from compartment to compartment and maybe a more realistic um, sort of um, transfer type of assay um, looking at the precipitation. So um, we've seen uh, that we have other examples that um, for dipyridamol, um, itraconazole as well, where we've seen a little bit better um, IV, IVE using the ASD model. Um, we're still going through all the data sets in the literature. Um, the data is kind of limited. There, there's maybe some posiconazole data as well. Um, we're going through all that data and, and, and examining that ourselves as well to see if that um, will, will improve the IVIV substantially. Um, so uh, that's why we added those, those two in particular experiments to, to, to definitely look at that case that you're, that you're talking about there. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, a couple of people asked uh, the same question. Uh, one of them commented that it's a very impressive list of new apparatus models that have been added to version 6. Um, any plans to incorporate the um, USP Apparatus 3 experiment to DDD Plus? Yeah, that, that was one consideration that even we we're thinking about trying to get into this um, this release uh, but we we you know we're working on some of the other more of the precipitation related assays so um, we we uh, that's definitely um, on the list so I think the I know I'm going to get this question so I'm going to bring it up um, when are you going to have multiple solubilities so like amorphous um, versus crystalline solubility. Um, that'll probably be in the next version. And, uh, and again, we're going to add different apparatuses to the, to the next version. And I, I think you'll be happy with the fact that we will have the multiple solubility inputs in our next version of Gastro Plus as well. So um, we, yeah, we are, we are um, aiming on adding these types of uh, new apparatus, uh, not new apparatus, but the USP3. And, and um, I think we want to add some of the more small scale dissolution apparatuses. So we have the micro disc profiler, but you know, the serious inform as well, um, you know, um, so any, any of the new small scale apparatuses as well, we were interested in getting in there in the um, software. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. Um, a question about, I believe the biphasic experiment, 
Um, is there an option in the experiment to um, incorporate some paddle for the organic phase to ensure that there is sufficient hydrodynamics in both phases? Or is that something that we need to worry about with the model? Well, so we don't really, there was, we didn't really have, um, the, the way you would uh, enter that information in currently is with the, so we added, allowed you to modify the um, hydrodynamic boundary layer um, thickness which is determined by the stirring rate. So um, that's currently the way you would modify that. We don't have any good um, correlations between mixing speed and mixing paddle type in the organic phase versus the boundary layer thickness. So we added it as an input that you'll have to input your, uh, you know, yourself. Um, as more information becomes available, maybe there's some computational fluid dynamics Maybe there's some other things we can look at to try to estimate those boundary layer thicknesses. But for right now, it's kind of a nebulous input that, you, that you're going to have to determine. And, and people have looked at it in literature, you know, based on, um, you know, what the normal conditions are for these apparatuses, what the normal boundary layer thicknesses you would expect are. So those have been published. You can look at them, and it's about 30 microns or so. And... and um, and so you at least have a starting place with which to start at. Um, but uh, in the end, you're, you may have to generate a correlation for yourself, for your own apparatus, where you look at the RPM versus the boundary layer thickness and input that into the software for, for your situation. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Um, sticking with the theme of apparatus, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the um, model in DDD Plus for the dynamic flow-through cell, the USP4, and any considerations for uh, dynamic media change in that experiment? Yeah, so um, I, I, we, we still have the uh, media phases within that. Um, however, I... I uh, we didn't really um, make that as robust as the normal USP2 and 1 exper experiment. So you do have the opportunity to change sort of the pHs that are going on and stuff like that. Um, but the options are a little bit less robust there. Um, so, but you can, you can use those functionalities um, with dissolution phases with, with, the, um, with the USP uh, flow through um, experiment. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Uh, shifting gears here a little bit, uh, some questions around just general modeling and especially integration with Gastro Plus. So uh, first, this new F1, F2 tool uh, or the updates to the tool, can the uh, calculation be applied for modified release formulations? Uh, it would be applicable to any dissolution curve you feed into it. Um, so. It's general to anything. Um, you could calculate the F1 and F2 on some random data that wasn't even dissolution. It wouldn't even matter. You could just plug it into the DSD file and run it through there. So it should work on anything. As long, you know, obviously you're going to get poor F1 and F2 values if the curves that you enter in aren't close in, in relation to one another. But um, as, as long as, you know, they're similar shaped curves, it, it'll calculate them properly and you'll get the correct F1 and F values. Um, so yeah, it should work for anything. Thank you, Jim. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on how DDD Plus could be used to help um, discriminate formulation differences for IR products or um, design a, an in vitro method that could help discriminate? between different IR formulations? So, I mean, in, in one case, as I mentioned, you know, one, one of the key aspects of the membrane test and one of the reasons why people use it is because it's really good at discriminating the actual formulation solubility of, your, of, a, of a given formulation. So whether or not you put in certain um, components of a formulation that, ca that allow you to solubilize more drug or whatnot, or you have an amorphous formulation or a 
co-crystal formulation. The membrane test is really good at allowing you to extract what the formulation solubility is. So if you wanted to simply look at different types of formulations you have in terms of how much they enhance the solubility, um, the membrane test is a good way to do that, is a good way to look at um, sort of the amorphous uh, solubility enhancement. Um, it's one way, anyway, uh, to do that. So that's one way to discriminate against different types of formulations. If, if you're looking at, um, obviously, di uh, differences in the same API form um, with different particle sizes, different disintegration amounts in a tablet, uh, then you would just use the regular IR tablet model, and you can, you know, obviously look at changes in particle properties and such and disintegration rates uh, to see how that would affect your formulation. Um, so that... Uh, there is a, a little bit, um, there is some additional opportunities now with the membrane test to look at those formulation differences. Um, but we've all also always had the ability to look at, you know, more like particle size differences and that kind of thing. So, Very good. Um, a couple of questions about the integration of GastroPlus and DDD Plus. And these are very uh, general questions about how one could utilize or apply um, DDD plus to help inform the gastro plus simulations, predicting in vitro dissolution uh, and using that as a first input for simulating the in vivo dissolution and absorption. Could you talk about the reverse on how we could use gastro plus results to help either with the formulation design or dissolution method development? Yeah, so that's the um, that that's really what I went through in the last uh, webinar. I think what was it? It's been two years ago now. Um, we probably still have it posted on our website. If you go look at that, this really that really has a more in depth discussion of this topic. So I would whoever's interested, I'd go look at that. Um, but uh, so when you use Gastro Plus, obviously when you do the mechanistic deconvolution. Um, you can actually determine the in vivo dissolution rate of that's ne uh, necessary to produ produce a in vivo uh, response, and you can take that then and take that as sort of um, the dissolution rate you would need to sort of at least be able to match in vitro um, if you had a biorelevant method at least maybe a maybe some sort of gastric to intestinal buffer transit method. Um, that's going to be the, your gold standard of what you'd want to sort of try to match with your uh, formulation. So um, you could then bring that curve into DDD plus and try to, you know, play around with particle size if it's a, a conventional formulation, and then you know maybe look at see what maybe solubility enhancement would do for uh, for you if, if if you needed to match a certain uh, dissolution profile um, so you could then go play around with um, sort of what if scenarios in DDD plus as far as trying to match that in vivo um, dissolution rate um, and then you can also the other thing you can do is if you have a given like let's say CR formulation and you're trying to hit some kind of target in vivo you can use those same gastro plus functions to deconvolute the in vivo dissolution rate um, and then sort of try to look at uh, modifying the polymer um, grades or whatever uh, and or filler to uh, uh, let's say HPMC matrix tablet to sort of uh, tune the, the dissolution rate of your in vitro formulation you could do that within gastro plus so I would urge you it's it's kind of a it's a very general question. It's a hard topic to answer in one specific, you know, quick answer. But if you go look at that uh, last webinar we did for the DD, DDD plus five release, I think you'll find um, a nice discussion of that. That's more long form. So, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I think we have addressed all of the questions for today, and so we'll start to wrap up. Um, this is going to conclude today's webinar. Uh, as a reminder, the playback will be available online at our Resource Center. And at any point, if you would like more information on DDD+, Gastro Plus, or any of our other products or services offered by Simulations Plus, Cognigen, or Dillysim Services, uh, please be sure to visit our website, again, www.simulations-plus.com 
And uh, be sure to also connect with us on one of our social media channels for the latest news and events. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, have a wonderful day and also happy holidays. Bye-bye.